Good morning, and welcome to Macro 101, an introduction to Macro's quality payment program and its impacts on Medicare Part D reimbursement. Before we get started, just a couple of housekeeping items. During today's presentation, your slides will be automatically synchronized with the audio, so you do not need to flip any slides to follow along. You can listen through your computer speakers or dial into the number provided on your screen. To submit a question to the speakers at any time during the presentation, do so by typing into the question box that says, Ask a Question, in the lower left portion of your player. If you need technical assistance, please click on the question mark in the upper right-hand corner of your player to see a list of frequently asked questions and contact info for tech support. And now I would turn it over to Mandy Gilman, um, who will be our first speaker today. Mandy, go ahead. Hi, thank you so much and welcome everyone. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Mandy Gilman. I'm the Senior Director of Public Policy and Research at the Association for Behavioral Healthcare. Um, I staff uh, ABH's Quality and Outcomes Committee, and um, that's the reason I'm helping welcome you to the webinar today. I know many of you through, uh, through that uh, responsibility I have. If you're not currently involved with the Quality and Outcomes Committee and would like to be, you know, please be in touch at any time. Um, thanks for joining the webinar today. Uh, MACRA is important legislation, and ABH has asked for this webinar exclusively for its members to help them better understand the MACRA Quality Payment Program. I want to thank the folks from the National Council who will introduce themselves in a minute um, for doing this webinar just for ABH members here in Massachusetts. And the webinar will discuss how Medicare clinicians' performance will be measured, how it may impact Medicare Part B reimbursement starting in 2019. Measurement does begin in 2017, and many of you know that MACRA is taking the place of the value modifier PQRS and um, meaningful use programs. So uh, it's important for uh, members to be up on those changes. So I look forward to your questions at the end of the webinar, and thank you for joining us. So thank you. And I know, Elizabeth, I think you're going to begin. Thank you so much, uh, Mandy. This is Elizabeth Arend. I'm the Quality Improvement Advisor at the National Council for Behavioral Health. And I'd just like to say good morning to my fellow Massachusetts. Uh, I, am, I was raised in Hingham, so it's just a, it's a pleasure to be able to speak with you this morning and, uh, and share a little information about MACRA. Uh, here's the outline of our presentation. We'll start with an overview of the MACRA proposed rule, uh, which was released in April. Um, we'll go over the timeline for implementation, uh, whether or not you are eligible, and the two paths to payment. Um, and then we'll go a little bit in depth into the merit-based incentive payment system, which is the path to payment um, that we expect most behavioral health care providers that bill Medicare Part B um, will be subject to in 2017. Uh, we'll go a little bit into the reporting mechanisms, and then we have a case study uh, from South Shore Mental Health in Quincy, Massachusetts, uh, and then we'll have a few tips on how you can start preparing. So um, we also will reserve some time at the end for Q&A. So um, feel free to, uh, to submit your questions as we go along in the, in the chat box. Um, and uh, so there's a lot of material to cover, so we'll get started. Uh, again, my name is Elizabeth Arend, and I am joined today by Nina Marshall, our Senior Director for Policy and Practice Improvement here at the National Council, and she will moderate our Q&A, and Martha Ryan um, at the Manager for Meaningful Use at South Shore Mental Health. So let's dive in. So MACRA stands for the Medicare Access and CHIP Reauthorization Act. It was bipartisan legislation signed in 2015. And the proposed rule, uh, which, I, as I said, was released in April, um, repeals the sustainable growth rate formula and fundamentally changes the way that Medicare reimburses clinicians by rewarding value over volume. Uh, and this is all to get to, um, to Medicare's goal for 90% of all Medicare fee-for-service payments to be tied to quality or value um, in, in, uh, by 2018. So this is a big step um, in that direction. So big, big transi transition is underway, and uh, we want to make sure that all of our uh, member organizations are prepared for it. There are two paths to payment. Clinicians can choose either the Merit-Based Incentive Payment System, or MIPS, which streamlines multiple existing quality programs, as Mandy said, or they can report to CMS through an Advanced Alternative Payment Model, or APM, which provides bonus payments for participation. 
based on CMS's own calculations, more than 90% of eligible clinicians will be subject to MIPS, not just behavioral health care providers, but all providers. So only 8% will be able to report under advanced APM. So we will provide an overview of both um, payment structures, but the main focus will be MIPS because we, we anticipate that this will uh, be the program that is most likely to affect behavioral health care providers. Uh, as Mandy said, the implementation timeline um, goes, MACRA goes into effect on January 1st, 2017, so this is, this is just around the corner, uh, and CMS will use reporting in 2017 to determine uh, neg uh, negative, neutral, or positive payment adjustments in 2019. I know that CMS Acting Administrator Andy Slavitt suggested uh, last month that CMS might be open to delaying implementation in order to give clinicians more time to prepare, uh, but as of now, January 1st is still, the, uh, is still our expected start date. So let's start uh, with MIPS eligibility, because we want to be really clear on who's eligible and who is not for 2017. First, um, in 2017, the quality payment program will affect uh, Medicare Part B clinicians, including physicians, and this includes psychiatrists, physician assistants, nurse practitioners, clinical nurse specialists, and certified registered nurse anesthetists who bill Medicare Part B. So these are all what, what we call MIPS-eligible clinicians in 2017. In 2017, the, the quality payment program will not apply to clinical psychologists and licensed clinical social workers, although they might be added uh, in 2019. Um, also, if this is your first year billing Medicare, if you are working at a hospital or a facility, uh, you, you, the quality payment program does not apply to you. Clinicians under uh, CMS's low volume threshold who serve uh, fewer than 100 Medicare recipients and bill, and bill Medicare less than $10,000 per year are also not eligible. To, uh, to participate in 2017, uh, as well as clinicians and groups who are not paid under the Medicare Physician Fee Schedule, like FQHCs and partial hospitalization programs. So, um, so we, you know, if you have any questions about this, um, we, we will be happy to address them, but we just wanted to be very clear up front um, that as of 2017, um, there are some clinicians that are, are, will be subject to MIPS, um, but there are some, some that will not. Uh, and these eligibility criteria might change over time, um, but for 2017, this is what eligibility looks like. So let's um, spend a few minutes on Advanced Alternative Payment Models, or APMs. I'm sure many of you are familiar with APMs, which are built on the traditional fee-for-service architecture but incentivize value over volume. Um, and as defined by MACRA, APMs include um, the ones here on your screen, the CMS Innovation Center model, um, the Medicare Shared Savings Program, um, et cetera. For advanced APMs, uh, which is the, one of the tracks of the quality payment program, participants have to use certified electronic rec health record technology, and advanced APMs have to carry more than nominal financial risk or be a medical home model expanded under uh, CMMI authority. So we know that this is probably not an option for the majority of behavioral health care providers. The Merit-Based Incentive Payment Program, uh, or uh, MIPS, uh, is what we expect uh, most behavioral health care providers to be subject to as of 2017. MIPS consolidates three qu qu current uh, quality incentive payment programs, starting with the Physician Quality Reporting System, or PQRS, which requires eligible professionals to report on clinical quality measures. The Electronic Health Records Incentive Program, which you probably know as Meaningful Use, which provides incentive payments for certain healthcare providers to use electronic health records technology to improve patient care. And the Value-Based Payment Modifier, which uses claims and PQRS data to adjust Medicare payments based on quality and cost of care. So to be clear, these three programs are not, dis they're not going away, they're not disappearing. They are being consolidated under MIPS 
and they're going to be slightly tweaked. So there, ha there are some changes uh, to these three programs, but they're definitely not going away. Um, and then we have a new category called Clinical Quality Improvement Activities. Um, and this is, this is a new performance category that enables clinicians to choose from a list of more than 90 quality improvement activities and, uh, and determine which ones best suit their practice. So CMS is going to uh, factor all of these four weighted performance categories to create eligible clinicians' uh, composite performance score. So you see all these four categories up on your screen, and you'll notice that each one has a different weight. Uh, and quality in 2017 um, carries the most weight at 50%. So CMS is going to factor all of these categories together to come up with a, a composite performance score between 0 and 100. Um, and if you score above their uh, performance threshold, uh, you, will be, you will receive a positive payment adjustment. If you score at or below um, that performance threshold, you will receive either a neutral or negative payment adjustment. But there are two important things uh, to note here. Number one, CMS might change the weight of these categories over time. And they might change the weight of the categories depending on the clinician's reporting capabilities. So we'll, we'll go into that a little bit in a, in a moment. But first, you see the, I, I'd like to go over the MIPS payment adjustment. So as I said, once an eligible clinician receives his or her score, CMS is going to compare it to the performance threshold for that year. And in 2019, you'll see that the uh, potential payment adjustment is up to positive, uh, positive 4% or negative 4%. And those payment adjustments will change over time, going all the way up to 9% by 2022. All of these MIPS uh, payment adjustments are budget neutral, which means that the total upward and downward adjustments will be equal. So here you can see, um, when we bring it all together, we can see that this is what the next decade will look like. And you'll notice that the fee schedule will continue to get a positive adjustment through 2019, but there will be no change from 2020 to 2025. So the, op the best option here is uh, if you're eligible for MIPS, is to, uh, is to clearly get ready and perform as well as possible so you can benefit from uh, positive payment adjustments. As you can see from, uh, MIPS, uh, from CMS's projections, MIPS adjustments will likely hit solo and small practices the hardest. An estimated 70% of eligible clinicians in practices with two to nine clinicians and 80% of solo practices will experience uh, a negative payment adjustment. But uh, before you panic, um, the proposed rule does acknowledge that clinicians in small practices, as well as practices in rural or health professional shortage areas, have unique challenges. So CMS has proposed some flexibility in MIPS to account for uh, diversity among practices. And this includes flexibility in MIPS scoring uh, based on applicable measures. So if, if you are not able to, um, to, to report all of the required measures in a particular category, uh, that category might not be included in your MIPS score. Um, MIPS also uh, provides for virtual groups. Um, this will not go into effect until at least uh, the 2018 reporting period, uh, but CMS is, uh, CMS is still fleshing this idea out. But for, um, for smaller practices, they've built into the proposed rule and option for um, small practices to, to group themselves together in virtual groups for the sake of reporting to make it a little bit easier. So let's just go into the MIPS performance categories in a little more depth, starting with quality. So as I said, quality is an adaptation of the PQRS program, and it requires providers to choose six quality measures to report on that best reflect their practice, as opposed to nine under PQRS. So that's, that's good news, <laughs> assuming that you now no, no longer have to report nine measures, you only have to report six. It also eliminates the uh, requirement to, um, to report those measures across three NQS domains. So, so that's also good news. Um, one has to be an outcome or other high priority measure. Uh, and then you also have to have a cross-cutting measure just like under PQRS. And I've listed a few examples uh, there on your screen. Uh, unfortunately, the <laughs> MIPS, like PQRS, uh, does provide just a very limited number of behavioral health 
related quality measures. Um, but if a clinician or group can only report on, on three or four measures, CMS may, be, may reduce the weight of that quality category and reassign the missing weight proportionally to other categories um, to accommodate for that. So, um, and we've also been informed by CMS just, late, just last week um, that, there is a, that there will be a process in place, just like there is under PQRS, um, to, for when clinicians report fewer than the required measures. Um, so you won't necessarily be penalized. As long as you've reported on all of the measures that are applicable and appropriate to your practice, um, then you should be able to get um, credit for those measures. The next uh, category I'll speak about is advancing care information. So this is an adaptation of the Medicare uh, EHR incentive program. To be clear, this does not affect participation in Medicaid meaningful use, okay? So this, is, this just uh, affects Medicare. Um, first, this requires MIPS eligible clinicians to use certified EHR technology, um, and clinicians uh, can, can report on a customizable set of measures that reflect how they use this technology in day-to-day -day practice. Uh, and there's a particular emphasis on protect, protecting patient information, patient electronic access, coordination of care through patient engagement, electronic prescribing, health information exchange, and clinical data register, uh, registry reporting. So here is uh, just a slide that summarizes how the uh, advancing care information uh, category will be scored. You'll see that there is a base score, um, which, uh, which is worth 50 points, a performance score, which is worth 80 points, and then a possible bonus point. Um, this is all supposed to add up to 100 points. Um, so, even if, so if you score more than 100, you would just get 100 points and you would get full credit um, and your full 25% weight for your uh, composite performance score. The base score is your score for participation in reporting. This is based on uh, 2015 meaningful use measures, uh, but there is no performance threshold. Um, and clinicians just have to report the numerator and denominator uh, or, as appropriate, um, just a yes or no statement for each measure. And here you have the objectives uh, for the base score measures. The performance score is, uh, is, is uh, scores your performance at vari varying levels, of, so this is over and above the base score requirements, and it focuses just on those three objectives on your screen. For each measure, a clinician can earn up to 10% of their performance score uh, based on their performance rate. Uh, if this is all sounding confusing and overwhelming, don't worry. Uh, <laughs> I think I, you're not alone. Um, the National Council is developing some written materials to uh, explain this in plain English, uh, which we will upload to our website and, uh, and circulate with the, 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 this webinar recording. So don't worry if this is all sounding um, very complicated right now. Um, this is, this uh, webinar is intended to be an overview, and uh, we, will, we will provide you with all the written material and, and guidance that you need to further, further wrap your head around this. So uh, we know that many behavioral health providers do have an EHR and uh, are quite sophisticated with their ER EHR technology, but, uh, but some are not. Um, so we just, we just wanted to uh, reassure you that the proposed rule acknowledges this, uh, that many MIPS eligible clinicians um, have not had past experience using EHR technology because they weren't able to participate in the Medicare EHR incentive program. Um, so it recognizes that there might not be sufficient measures that are applicable and available to certain types of MIPS eligible clinicians. Um, if this is the case, CMS proposes assigning a different scoring weight, including a weight of zero, based on the extent to which uh, this particular performance category applies to each clinician. Um, so it is possible that if uh, a clinician um, does not have access to uh, certified uh, EHR technology, for example, that um, this per particular performance category simply would not be factored into their score. Uh, CMS would then redistribute the weight to other categories to make up the difference. In 2017 only, reporting in the advancing care information category is optional for nurse practitioners, uh, physician's assistants, and clinical nurse specialists. And, uh, and this is also an acknowledgement on CMS's part that these particular clinicians may not have had um, extensive experience with EHR technology. For, so for just 2017, um, this category, uh, reporting in this category is optional for those clinicians. Um, also clinicians with low Medicare patient volumes 
or insufficient, insufficient internet connectivity uh, could, might also be exempt from reporting in this category. Resource use is an adaptation of the value-based modifier payment program. Uh, so this performance category compares one provider's Medicare Part B charges for a patient condition or episode of care against another provider's charges. Uh, there are no behavioral health related categories in the proposed rule, so we'll have to keep an eye on the final rule, which is expected to be released in early November. Um, but in the meantime, the important things to remember uh, are that there is no independent reporting uh, required for this. This is all based on CMS claims analysis, so there's no additional reporting burden for this category. Um, and again, like with all the other categories, there are exceptions to the rule. Like if, if, you're, uh, if an individual clinician or group can't report in this category but reports on at least three quality measures, the resource use uh, category weight uh, would be added to the quality category, making the quality category weigh 60% of your composite performance score. The final, uh, fourth and final category um, is the clinical practice improvement activity category. So this is brand new. Uh, this category rewards practices that engage in quality improvement activities, including for their Medicaid and other non-Medicare patient populations. So uh, examples of activity on, activities on the current list include uh, integrated behavioral and mental health. You'll see that category at the bottom of your screen. Uh, so we were, we were very excited to see that, uh, that this category was added under the proposed rule. So this includes uh, activities related to primary and behavioral health care integration, care coordination and expanding access to care, um, use of condition-specific pathways of care for chronic conditions like depression, and provision of peer-led support and self-management. So, um, so on the next slide, we'll see a few examples of, um, of the clinical practice improvement activities in that, in that category. Some other clinical practice improvement activities that are relevant to behavioral health are, appear here on your screen, and you'll see that they all um, are assigned different points. So all of the CPIAs uh, are, are either weighted um, medium with 10 points or uh, high with 20 points. Um, the total number of points you can possibly get for this uh, category is 60. So as long as you are, um, as long as you get uh, a total of 60 points, then you'll get full credit in this in this particular category. And this diagram here just shows you how CMS is going to um, is going to figure out that score. Um, the interesting and exciting thing to me about this category is that your your practice is probably already engaged in quality improvement activities. So there, um, so a really great way to uh, prepare for MIPS would be to take a look at those 90 plus activities and see where there's overlap and see um, what kind of activities you're already engaged in um, and which ones you might have to uh, modify slightly to uh, to adhere to CMS's definitions um, and see where other opportunities may lie to maximize your, your score. Okay, we're in the home stretch, hang in there. So, <laughs> so we've got next um, just a few slides about MIPS reporting. Uh, depending on how you choose to report, just like PQRS, you can report as an individual or as a group. Your data could be reported through third-party vendors like qualified clinical data registries, uh, health IT vendors that obtain data from your certified EHR technology, or CMS-approved survey vendors. You can also uh, report through your EHR through attestation or administrative claims, that's for individual reporting only, um, or through the CMS web interface if you are part of, uh, if you're reporting through a group of uh, 25 or more clinicians. Um, and available reporting mechanisms vary slightly by performance category. Quality measure reporting. Um, individuals or groups who submit quality measure data using QCDRs, qualified registry, registries, or, the, uh, or via your EHR need to, need to report on at least 90% of, uh, of your patients that meet the measures denominator criteria. And this is true regardless of payer for the performance period. This is all patients. Um, so in other words, CMS will expect to receive that quality data for Medicare and non-Medicare patients. 
if you are reporting as an individual to MIPS and you're submitting data on quality measures uh, through your Medicare Part B claims, you would report on at least 80% of the Medicare Part B patients seen during that performance period. Um, we don't necessarily recommend that. We know that uh, reporting via claims is a really time-consuming process and it is prone to error. Uh, if any of you have reported as an individual using claims under PQRS, um, I'm sure you, you're, you're familiar with that. Um, so, but, that, but this is still an option under MIPS. Both individuals and groups can submit their data via multiple mechanisms. But uh, everybody has to use the same identifier. And under the proposed rule, CMS has uh, proposed using your tax identification number and your national provider uh, identifier for all performance categories. Um, and you can only use one submission mechanism per category. And now, uh, I'm sure you've all fully absorbed that. <laughs> um, I'd like to uh, hand it over to Martha Ryan at uh, South Shore Mental Health. I've asked her to present um, a, sort of a case study of how South Shore Mental Health has uh, reported to PQRS in the past and the lessons they've learned and how they're using those lessons to prepare for MIPS. Thank you so much for joining us today, Martha. I'll hand it over to you. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, as you said, I'm Martha Ryan. I'm the manager of Meaningful Use at South Shore Mental Health. Um, over the past five years, I've worked with South Shore Mental Health in compliance, uh, quality, meaningful use, uh, and PQRS. Uh, next slide, please. South Shore Mental Health provides services to approximately 16,000 clients in southeastern Massachusetts. And as you can see, we provide a wide array of services. Um, our story is not one of doing everything perfectly. Uh, what I want to share to you is uh, share with you is our story of how we began uh, this journey, of how we took baby steps, um, and how we managed to get involved in meaningful use and PQRS reporting. Next slide, please. So all the programs that we're talking about that are being rolled up into MIPS uh, talk about quality. Um, and how I think about that with our organization is really a culture shift in how we think about that uh, word quality. So traditionally, uh, we have a strong focus on quality services, as I'm sure um, everybody does. Um, we are focused on client-centered treatment. Uh, responding to individual needs. We have comprehensive staff training and supervision. Um, our high quality has traditionally been reflected in consumer satisfaction surveys. But with programs like PQRS, um, now we have to look at, well, how do we measure that? How do we quantify uh, quality? And we now measure quality by choosing measures, which staff may or may not feel represent quality because those measures are somewhat limited um, and do not always represent uh, the core of the services that we're uh, providing. Um, but over time, as we've been implementing those measures, the intrinsic value is increasing as they're incorporated into workflows, and I'll talk about that a little bit more. Next slide. So the first thing I would recommend and the, and the first uh, most important thing that we did was to develop a strong process. So in 2012, South Shore Mental Health convened a meaningful use group. Um, in MIPS, that's going to be the advancing care information. And meaningful use laid the foundation for establishing a strong base from which to work from. Um, this is a weekly meeting. Uh, it is a cross-functional group of leaders from across the organization. And as we look to implement the meaningful use standards, there was a lot of resistance um, to adding work to an already stressed workforce. Um, we heard a lot of, there is no time to do that. Or uh, we may have heard, we're already doing that. Or we already asked those questions. We do those assessments. But the problem may have been um, that they weren't documenting it. Well, maybe they weren't documenting some of those things at all. Maybe it was documented as a text field. Maybe it was in the wrong type of form in the EHR. So we needed to make a lot of changes. Um, and the pain of implementation was really um, the administrative burden that was added to clinicians as we tried to integrate uh, these programs. But over time, the group has become much more efficient at implementing new workflows, um, from configuring the electronic health record, developing forms and reports, doing training, um, outreach, uh, incorporating feedback uh, from our programs. 
we, we have developed a strong process. So that in 2014 when we added, when we decided to start reporting on PQRS, we added this to the scope of work for the group and it was um, a really easy way uh, to, to start our, our process with PQRS. Next slide, please. So once we decided to report on PQRS, we had a lot of questions. Um, we, you know, should we report as an individual or as a group? We have a certified EHR, can we report directly from it? Um, should we report through claim submissions? What's the caps? Does it apply to us? Um, there are so many different measures and it depends on which reporting method you have. How, how do we start to, to know what we should report on? You know, what is a cross-cutting measure? Um, we knew that especially initially we couldn't report on all those measures. We can't report on non-measures. Does it make sense to report at all? And so the really um, important part or, or choice that we made was to go with a qualified registry for reporting. And the piece that was most helpful to us in that choice was the availability of consultation and support. Um, they were able to answer our questions. Um, they always picked up the phone every time I called. Um, it was really important in terms of getting our process up and off the ground, and it gave us confidence in knowing that we were on the right track and that it would be worthwhile. Um, and as we proceeded in our reporting, um, they helped us make um, critical decisions like registering as a, as a group, which made it easier for us. Next slide, please. So as I said, um, we did not uh, start out strong with nine measures across three domains, um, but through the consultation of the qualified registry, we learned about something called the measure applicability and validation process. In PQRS, this is called the MAS process. And this process um, is different depending on what reporting method you choose. It applies if it's not appropriate or possible to report on the nine PQRS measures across three domains. Um, the measures that you choose have to apply to your practice. Um, if one is in a measure, if one of the, the measures that you choose is in a measure cluster, then they make assumptions that all of those measures um, apply to you. Um, and you need to report a cross-cutting measure. Um, this is how we were able to report successfully even though we weren't able to do all of the reporting at once. Um, it is an, analytic, an analytically complex process. It's a little opaque, which again is why we relied on our consultants to assure us that this would be the right way to go and that we would be able to successfully report this way. Next slide, please. So our first step, um, it was really late in 2014. We decided we were going to go for it. We were going to report PQRS. And we chose this measure. It is unhealthy alcohol use uh, screening. We chose it because it was already part of our standardized assessments and our processes. The first year that we did this, we did manual audits as our records were a hybrid of records in the EHR and records still on paper. In the second year, in 2015, we implemented a standalone assessment in the EHR, which met this measure. Um, and we built reports and processes to provide completion rates to programs, improve performance, and it was much, much easier having it all integrated into the EHR. Um, and then, in 2016, the measure was dropped. Like, oh no, we just got this going. Like, how could you change this on us? Um, but it was modified to include cessation counseling. So we had to quickly shift to add um, some uh, tweaks to our assessment that also include uh, brief counseling. Um, and I think that's a sign of times to come that, uh, like we talked about before with the strong process, that it's going to be important to be able to respond quickly to an always changing environment and be able to report different things as we go forward. Next slide, please. So, in 2015, um, we increased our reporting to include tobacco use, uh, screening and cessation intervention. Um, this was combined with the alcohol screening. Uh, it seems to make sense. It goes well together. Uh, it was a relatively easy add. Um, we did have to evaluate um, how we would capture cessation intervention. It's um, a non billable uh, code. Our EHR didn't really easily accommodate for that. 
So we had to get creative about how we captured that as discrete data so that we could report easily on this. Um, we had to do training on what, you know, how, how we could meet this standard with a, the clinicians that are conducting the assessments. And we wanted to implement it to minimize additional burdens. So we chose uh, questions that were very um, basic. We, we were trying to do sort of the minimum necessary to meet this because we were concerned about their time. Um, however, the feedback that we've gotten is that really clinicians are spending more time on this than we in sometimes intended because once they start talking about it, it often opens um, a richer dialogue and it, it becomes, um, uh, you know, uh, something that they, they really want to work with clients on. Next slide, please. So what are some of the challenges uh, that we went through? This is really in the context of our process with Meaningful Use and PQRS. Um, but one of the challenges was uh, the maturity of our EHR and the technical difficulties um, that we had just trying to get everything stood up and working properly. We spent a lot of time working with our vendor uh, to do some problem resolution. Um, the challenges of administrative burden, um, that you have to check off this box, that you have to go to this new form, that you have to do it um, differently than you've done it in the past. You know, getting away from that paper mindset and, and looking into more flexible electronic environments. Um, the challenges were modifying workflow. So we're doing things differently and that, uh, you know, comes with its own resistance. But like I said, over time, um, that's gotten easier. Um, the challenge of measure choice. So um, CMS has um, pretty limited choices for behavioral health in their programs. Um, and then within our electronic health record, whether it's the clinical quality measures for meaningful use or what measures we can realistically implement with the technical constraints are even more limited. So um, at this point, our choices are pretty um, slim. Uh, there are changing requirements, like I mentioned with the alcohol assessment, as measures become topped off, as they don't really um, provide uh, an, a CMS an ability to um, distinguish providers from one another, they get dropped or they get changed. Um, and then for us, we're enrolled in the Medicaid EHR program, so our meaningful use is through the state. So even though MIPS is going to roll up the three programs for Medicare, we have to continue to report um, through the state for meaningful use, so we have additional reporting requirements. Next slide, please. So these are our lessons learned. Um, I think first and foremost, our success um, was contingent on executive level support. Uh, we had strong um, support and sponsorship of this from our leadership. Uh, I would recommend that you start sooner rather than later. Uh, you know, the earlier you can start doing this, the earlier you can develop that uh, workflow and that process to respond to the, the changes that the regulatory environment is bringing. Um, measure choice is really talking about prioritizing measures that don't add administrative burden, but balancing that with measures that are meaningful to uh, your clinician's practice. Uh, strong process, again, is just the importance of having uh, a workflow where you can acclimate to change, where you can rapidly respond um, to implementation of new requirements. And last consultation, I, we have found invaluable the, the qualified registry and our, our consultants that we've gotten from that process, somebody who can answer our questions and, and give us some validation that we're on the right track. Next slide, please. So just um, my two cents for how, how to prepare for MIPS. Um, I would say start right now, no matter where you are, um, like we did, just baby steps. Um, there's no time like the present to begin. You will want to choose a reporting method and evaluate what's best for you, whether um, an individual uh, or group. I would recommend conducting a technical inventory, so depending on what kind of EHR you have or whether you're on an EHR, investigate um, whether the measures that you choose, uh, you know, how realistic is it to implement it through that environment. 
I would evaluate overlapping measures, um, clinical quality measures and meaningful use. Um, there is some overlap with PQRS and with the proposed MIPS measures, so um, that makes it easier if, if you have that alignment. And the last thing is that I would choose measures that reflect what you do with an eye towards integrated health. And um, that's been an adjustment for us as well. It's really broadening our scope and understanding that it's not just behavioral health or primary care, um, that we're working on integrating those two. So that's it. Over to you, Elizabeth. Thank you so much, Martha. Um, continuing on how to prepare, um, that was a great that was a great uh, a great start. Um, fantastic tips, um, and I, I will I will reiterate. Start now, <laughs> um, and, uh, and if you're already participating, oh, I, I'm getting some feedback, Martha. If you could put yourself on mute, please. Thank you. Uh, so. First, you'll, you, you will want to start as soon as possible and if you, uh, to prepare, and if you are currently participating in PQRS, um, th you know, that's the, that is the best way to prepare for, for MIPS. Uh, if you're already familiar, familiar with the reporting structures um, and, the, and the quality measures in particular, um, that is the absolute best way to prepare. Um, as a first step, I would also say determine your eligibility. Uh, we went over eligibility at the very beginning of the webinar, and we know that MIPS will not apply uh, to licensed clinical, clinical social workers and clinical psychologists, for example, in 2017. Um, so, and uh, we also know that if, you, if your practice doesn't meet that low volume, th uh, low volume threshold, uh, or if you're at a hospital or a facility, this is, MIPS does not apply to you. So uh, you'll want to be really clear about whether or not you are eligible for MIPS. Uh, we recommend you educate your team, and that will be an ongoing process. As, as you've seen during this webinar, this is just an overview uh, of a 962-page of a document. So, um, so there's a lot to learn here. And, um, and so, so I would uh, t definitely recommend educating everyone in your practice uh, about the merit-based incentive payment system uh, and how this uh, will will um, affect your Medicare uh, reimbursement starting in 2019. Um, and the National Council is putting together not just uh, a webinar series, but also written materials. And we have a new page on our website uh, to provide you with, uh, with information to help you, to help you educate your team. We also encourage you to check out CMS's Transforming Clinical Practice Initiative, uh, or TCPI. This is a four-year CMS-funded initiative um, that has established what they call practice transformation networks um, all over the country. Uh, there are 29 practice transformation networks. Um, the National Council is leading one of those practice transformation networks that is focused on behavioral health um, in New York State. Um, but there might be a, a process transformation network uh, in Massachusetts that you could that you could join, and they are providing free technical assistance to help navigate uh, to help you navigate your way through through the uh, reporting process and help you prepare. Uh, and as always, stay up to date with us. Uh, you can join our you can sign up for our Capital Connector blog, uh, which comes out weekly, and uh, and stay on top of all the latest macro news. Um, like I said, we are we are uh, gearing up for the final rule, uh, which is expected in early November. So you can stay on top of the news uh, with our Capital Connector and our website. Coming up next, we also have uh, an, another webinar on Thursday. This is going to do uh, a deep dive on MIPS um, for a national audience. All of you are more than welcome to attend um, and, and bring other members of your team. Um, and then on August 16th, we're going to have a webinar featuring Martha, again, uh, from South Shore Mental Health, along with two other organizations, other behavioral health organizations, um, that have had different experiences with PQRS and, uh, and preparing for MIPS, and um, if you are looking for a for a PQRS and MIPS support group, this is it. Uh, so I encourage you to join and and learn from their experience and their uh, their challenges and their lessons learned. Um, they've got a, a lot of great um, concrete real world advice uh, for all of you as you prepare for uh, for for the MIPS process. So. Uh, one final reminder: the final rule. The final rule is uh, expected in November. So, um, 
just remember that all of this information is based on the proposed rule, and so some things might change. Um, so we encourage you to stay up to date with us, and we will uh, we look forward to communicating with you once that final rule is out, uh, and making sure you're you're uh, you're 100 percent prepared for when NIPS goes into effect on January 1st. And now I invite Nina Marshall to uh, moderate our questions and answers. Thank you, Elizabeth, and thank you, Martha, for um, providing that case study. That's really helpful. And I'm actually going to start, Martha, with some questions for you um, that have come in over the um, chat box. And I want to encourage um, our listeners today to submit any questions that uh, you might have that we can ask of Martha and Elizabeth. Um, so Martha, first, um, a couple of people have asked about what uh, EHR system um, your organization has been using, uh, what South Shore has been using. Uh, South Shore Mental Health is on NetSmart's avatar, uh, EHR. Okay, and then um, another question is around um, if you're comfortable sharing which uh, uh, qualified registry vendor you're using, I'm sure people would be interested in hearing that. But um, I'm also curious about what um, what you were looking for in a in a vendor. Um, so I, there are, there are many options that are out there, many vendors that CMS has approved. What were you looking for um, as you were selecting your vendor? Initially, uh, for South Shore Mental Health, um, we were working with Mihai um, and in close um, communication with them around our meaningful use efforts. So when they began providing um, the qualified registry services, we did that through Mihai. Uh, this year, they discontinued that. So we uh, sort of began anew, and we went to the CMS website and found a list of qualified registries. And I uh, just started making calls. And uh, the person that I chose was really based on um, who got back to me in a reasonable amount of time, um, who could answer my questions in a satisfactory way. Like, and I think you know some registries provide a really wide scope of services. Uh, we knew that we're, you know, we're just beginning, so we didn't need to buy a Ferrari. We just needed, um, you know, we we just needed the support of of the efforts that we've already engaged in. So um, once we, uh, you know, it, I would say I talked to maybe three or four people before we felt comfortable with making a choice this year. So um, we have not uh, reported yet with them, but we're, you know, we've been very satisfied to date. But I, I would just recommend looking at the choices on the CMS link. Great. That's a, a, a good remo reminder of the importance of customer service and timely responses. Um, so um, can you say a little bit about the interaction with the, with the registry? Is this something where you, you have one time reporting to them and then they handle the, the uploads to CMS? Is this like an ongoing feed um, or periodic? What is the interaction with the registry itself? Um, well, I can speak to um, our experience with Mihai as our, you know, as the qualified registry. You know, there was a lot of interaction with them initially as we were trying to choose our measures, as we were trying to set them up and make sure that the information we were collecting met the needs. Um, sometimes those were week weekly phone calls, um, you know, multiple emails, uh, sort of a lot of customer support. Um, but once it was up and going, uh, certainly we didn't need to maintain, you know, constant contact with that. And then um, at the end, when we were uh, getting ready to report, again, it just a little bit ahead of time, making sure that our reporting, um, you know, go going over the information that we had, that it met the requirements, and they did uh, talk us through, uh, you know, how to enter that um, and submit it on the on the interface, which. Uh, for us, it was really easy. Um, it was not a hard process at all. They were willing to, you know, really um, provide high level of support to make sure that you were entering it correctly, and it it wasn't a big deal. So I would say um, that the heaviest support really happened up front for us, the most critical piece, and just knowing that we were choosing the right measures, that we were on the right track, um, and that we were going to have the information we needed at the end of the year uh, to report successfully. Great, thank you. 
So I'm going to pose a couple of questions to Elizabeth now that have come in. Um, so one person asked about the, the, how the payment adjusted, adjustment will be applied um, uh, given that LCSWs are not part of, part of this first wave of required eligible clinicians. So will the, if, uh, if they choose not to participate, um, uh, and they have some physicians who, who participate in Medicare Part B, will that negative payment adjustment affect all of their claims, including for their LCSW services, or only those um, submitted under the physician uh, NPI number? So based on the proposed rule, our understanding is that the payment adjustments would only apply to your MDs, because they are eligible clinicians in 2017. Um, that said, I would encourage you to um, certainly help your LCSWs prepare. Um, they may not be eligible for MIPS until 2019, uh, but they'll want to, you'll want to make sure everyone on your team is, is uh, ready to hit the ground running. So, um, so the, yes, your MDs will, uh, will take a hit uh, <laughs> if they do not participate, um, and, uh, and they will be expected to report through MIPS, but your LCSWs and clinical psychologists will not in, 20, in 2017. Okay, thank you. Um, so another question that came in is related to the volume threshold and whether does that only apply to the reporting providers or to the entire organization? It's a great question, uh, and we, we discussed this with a representative from CMS last week, um, and our understanding is that the low volume threshold applies to individual clinicians, not to the entire organization. That is our understanding right now. Um, there may be more clarity in the, in the final rule, um, but if you as a clinician uh, bill Medicare less than $10,000 a year and treat fewer than 100 Medicare patients, um, then this, then MIPS would not apply to you. You would not meet that low volume threshold. So uh, another question that came in was related to um, what should those clinicians who don't have to report under MIPS do this coming year? Will PQRS continue, um, or is it, um, does it simply stop? My understanding is that PQRS is sunsetting, as they say. So, um, so, if, uh, so, so by all means, uh, participate in PQRS uh, for, for the 2016 reporting year. Uh, those payment adjustments will be made in 2018. Um, but PQRS is essentially um, being swallowed by, by MIPS. <laughs> so uh, it will not apply to you. If you are not an eligible clinician or, or don't meet the other eligibility criteria, um, then you will not be subject to MIPS in, in sorry, not be subject to PQRS in, in 2017. It is entirely replaced by MIPS. Um, so another thing that I, I personally have been wondering, and I, every time I sit through one of these webinars, I learn something new, um, but it's related to the comment about claims reporting being onerous. Um, so my impression of that would that be was that that would be a passive experience. You know, if you're doing claims-based reporting, that um, you are simply letting your Medicare claims speak for themselves. So what, um, Elizabeth, I'll start with you, and then, and then Martha, maybe if you could weigh in around, um, around uh, South Shore's dis uh, dis experience with this and your decision to use a registry. What, what is onerous about claims-based reporting? My understanding with, with individual claims reporting is that it, it's actually a very proactive process, um, not a passive process at all. Uh, you would not be able to simply um, submit your claim uh, per usual and expect CMS to uh, interpret and, and, and analyze it and uh, make the payment adjustments. Um, so the, the danger here is that uh, this, th that process is, is prone to error. There, there are several pitfall, um, possible pitfalls for the clinician uh, in terms of not documenting um, the, the quality measure correctly. And on the other end, you know, there, there are at least uh, four steps on CMS's end to uh, receive that claim, analyze that claim, approve that claim. If the claim is not approved, then you don't get any credit at all uh, for that PQRS quality measure. And then, um, and so there's a lot, there's even more uh, risk of error on CMS's side. So that's why it's, it has just a really high failure rate compared to using uh, a qualified clinical data registry or an EHR to do that reporting. So uh, 
uh, it is an option for individual clinicians, but um, I think you know everyone who has used that um, method under PQRS um, could attest to the fact that it is it is uh, not necessarily the most efficient uh, and foolproof way to report. Martha, do you have anything to add? Um, well, we've never we never did it that way, but my understanding is that you would need to submit non-billable codes, the CPT codes or the G codes, uh, you know, in addition to what you're doing. And for us, that still represented, um, you know, an administrative burden. Plus, uh, you know, our, our EHR doesn't really readily allow for that, so um, the registry was just a much easier way for us to report. Okay, thank you. Um, so um, I'm going to, Martha, this question came in for you around how how is South Shore demonstrating the cessation intervention criteria? Um, is, it, is it a radio button in your EHR um, indicating this, or are there other ways that you're demonstrating this? Yeah, we, we got creative with that, um, again, because um, we couldn't, we couldn't submit a co you know a non-billable code for that service, so we um, incorporated into the assessment um, a place where they could check off that they have done the the counseling, and then there's um, you know some some text box that allow for uh, support of that. But it's pretty it's pretty simple. But we do reporting off of those discrete data elements in the assessment. Thank you. Um, so uh, another question came in around the, the minimum number of uh, clients um, or cases, I, another way to think of it, that a clinic needs to report per year. So I, I saw, early, we talked, talked earlier about um, some versions of reporting where you have to, one one method, you have to do 80% of your available cases, and then the, another it's 90%, but there is a minimum number of cases for a measure to, to have sufficient volume. Is that right? Correct. I think it, uh, I think that minimum number of cases uh, is 20, uh, but this, this question might also be referring to the low volume threshold. Um, so that low volume threshold, again, is uh, if, if you as a clinician see fewer than 100 uh, Medicare patients per year, in 2017, and bill Medicare less than ten thousand dollars. That is the that is the low volume threshold. So if you have 101 patients and bill you know Medicare you know five dollars, you you don't meet the threshold because because you're over 100 patients. If you um, you know only have two patients that bill Medicare ten thousand ten thousand and one dollars, <laughs> you don't meet the threshold. So you you have to have both uh, both uh, you have to meet both criteria. All right, thank you. Um, so we have a couple of more questions here that I, we're not going to have time to get to right now. Um, I think we want to go over what some of the upcoming webinars are, a reminder of that. Um, but, um, you know, if there are any questions, Elizabeth, follow-up questions, Elizabeth's email is up here on the screen. So please, um, please reach out for any questions that you might have. Great, and thank you so much, Nina, and uh, thank you all for participating. Thank you to uh, to Mandy and to Martha. Uh, I hope this was a useful overview. Uh, I know it's a lot of information to take in, uh, but I encourage you to check out our website uh, and certainly join us this Thursday from 2 to 3 p.m. Eastern uh, and on Tuesday, August 16th uh, for our follow-up webinars uh, for a lot more information. And uh, thank you so much, and we hope you enjoy the rest of your day.